Hello everybody, welcome back to the workshop. So today I'm going to share with you some video clips of a conference that I demonstrated at. I demonstrated at the Western Artist Reserve Blacksmith Association this year at their uh, July conference. It was through the 13th and the 15th, I think it was, or 14th and 15th of July. Uh, it's been a little bit now since I'm making this video, finally getting around to posting it. I uh, had a great time. Did a couple swedge blocks, did a small stake anvil and a steel bowl as part of my demonstration for the two-day event. And so here's just some clips of that. Now, if you want to see an entire video of that demonstration, I'm going to leave a link to Frank Strock's channel in the description down below. He's a member of Rabba and he was kind enough to take and film the entire event and put it up over there on his YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, so go over there, check out the whole event if you care to. There's a lot of hours of video footage, but it's all pretty good stuff, um, you know, making the swedge block and things like that. So hope you all enjoy this quick little video. And again, the link will be in the description and I'll put it up here somewhere in this card and then at the end of this video as well. Thank you all once again. God bless you, and we'll catch you on the next one. And the secret to it, the secret to the whole action is the two second delay. And then I start my spew. So that's the, that's the secret, to, secret to all good YouTube videos there. Um, so, for those of you who know me, those of you who don't, I'm Roy Adams, Christ Center Ironworks. I've been a blacksmith for 10 years. Of that 10 years, I've been doing smithing professionally for seven years. And of that seven years, six of them have been full-time, my only occupation whatsoever. There was one weird little year of transition there between what I used to do, which was heating and air conditioning. Um, that was my main field of expertise that I worked in. And so now I do this full-time for a living. I also have a YouTube channel the YouTube channel is just Christ Center Ironworks. You can go find that on YouTube. I also got some business cards here in the back and pass around at the end of the day if anybody wants to look at that. Um, and also my regular business, uh, just regular business cards from my website and stuff. But we have over eight. We have almost, I think we're approaching 850 videos of content there, all centered around blacksmithing and business. And uh, so a lot of good information there if you guys are interested. What we're gonna be working on this weekend is we're going to be forging swedge blocks. So I did a whole, I did a video series on forging this little number right here, the small swedge block. I mainly did this out of a curiosity to see if I could do it and see if it was possible. If, you know, say I had a lot of people comment that, uh, you know, man, I'd love to find a swedge block. Where did you find, where would you find a swedge block or where would you get a swedge block at? And uh, I said, well, why don't you make one? And so I'm like, well, I'll take my own advice. And I'll make one, right? And so, uh, surprisingly though, uh, it turned out a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. It, and let's mark my words there. I said it's easier than I thought it was going to be. So, so if something goes wrong, you can feel free to heckle. Um, so that's one type that we're making. Uh, I kind of was inspired to do that off of my swedge block that I have that I use in my shop almost daily. That one right there. So, oh, I think you guys have all seen these, the Alec Mangle, Green Mangle. Oh, Green Mangle. I think that's how you pronounce and it. Going, and they're going out of business. Yeah, so, uh, great swedge block. This got a really neat story behind it. I went to Quad State one year, uh, and there was a guy selling one off the trailer. I forget what I paid. I want to say it was 200 and, it was 270 bucks at the time. And uh, I was just getting into it more as a... A, a, like a business kind of thing. This was like my second year ever doing it as business since so I was trying to find better tooling to use. And I went up to the guy at the trailer and I talked to the guy on the trailer and and this is a this is a bunny trail if you haven't figured it out yet. Talked to the guy at the trailer I said, I said man, I said, can you do any less on that? Can you do any less on that? He's like, no, I'm not taking any less. I'm like, all right, I'll wait the guy out. You know, I'll just come back every day until you know you kind of caves well i come back the next day oh man i just can't do it you know i mean it's a nice swedge block but you know can you take any less than anything no nope, no nope, not do it he's like get out of here hit the road you know and so i come back third and final day when he's going to pack up uh on sunday at quad state 
And I said, oh, I miss a man. I said, I, said, ah, I really want that swedge bot. Will you take any less of that? Finally, he pointed at me in the face. He said, look, kid. And he said, if you buy this swedge block, I guarantee you, you'll double your money back in the, you know, the first week that you use it. Uh, turns out he's right. I've made about a hundred times my money back out of that uh, over the course of the last six years or so that it's been in my shop. So uh, a very handy tool investment to have in the shop. It's a lot handier than you might think. There are just certain things that a swedge block lends itself to, uh, especially if you're a one guy shop like I am. Uh, you all have seen swedge blocks go in the, you know, the hardy hole, the anvil, and, and bottom fullers, and all sorts of things like that. This is really handy because you don't have to have all those individual tools. So if you don't can't make yourself that tool yet, you kind of got it all in one. And man, that was really handy for me when I was getting going. Now, of course, I've got the power equipment things, and I can make all my own tooling, so it's not a problem anymore. But, so that's what this one's patterned off of, kind of, sort of, loosely, and that's what I do, and I can pass that around for anybody who wants to take a look at that, get a feel for it. I'm going to get a battery. I was running low on juice. Right, that cooler's full of water there for you. Is it? Cool. Yeah. Test. Whoa. I got louder. Slightly more powerful in just a moment in time. And squeaky. That might have to be too much game. I might have to sit out there with you guys. <laughs> So the, so the swedge block that we are going to be making is something that is similar to that has the drifted holes through it. That's the first one that we're going to be doing. And then this one here we're going to turn into, this block is still here, we're going to turn into that swedge block that's being passed around. So you get a two for one special there. Any questions about the process so far? Pretty simple? Sorry, if you guys got questions while I'm up here, I'm here to instruct and to teach and to demonstrate. And if you got any questions, what throw. What material is that? Just mild steel, to the best of my knowledge. It was bought at the scrapyard two days prior to coming here. So. And, and preparation by you? Or? Yeah, just prepped by me. Flat disc. Um, you don't have to have anything special for a swedge block. Now, a lot of my tooling is mild steel tooling in my shop. Um, unless I am going to be using it for a lot of replication. Uh, because a lot of my work that I do now is custom. It's like a one-time deal. You know, I'm going to use that tool once and I'm never going to use it again. So there's no point in spending 50 bucks on tool steel to make one tool that's going to sit in a bin with a bunch of other tools that I've made. Uh, so I use a lot of mild steel. Uh, four different tooling and a swedge block, the theory behind that swedge block, you're bringing something hot or something more malleable than the swedge block to it. And so there really is no need for it to be a hard tool um, as long as it's a tough tool that can be dressed. And uh, if you were to, like that, that's a ductile swedge block there, that's like a ductile iron swedge block. Um, and if you put a nick in it and grind it out and it's right back good as new you know so you just clean it up uh, same thing with things like this this here just a mild steel big albeit big mild steel block and I've had this thing for four and a half years now so and, uh, it's held up to all the abuses I'm throwing at it of course if you miss a hammer blow it's got a nick in the face or you know, but that's just kind of part of the process. But the way I figure is I'll never break this tool in my lifetime. Somebody else will just torch cut it in half or throw it in the furnace. All right. So what is the measurement? Uh, six inches square. 
on the block. This one here, this was actually six inches by, I don't know, I want to say it was like seven inches or something like that. And then I just kind of beat it, kind of reformed it a little bit. This one was originally. And uh, so I went for a little thicker. This here is inch and, I'll tell you in a second, inch and a half. And there's nobody from Britain around here, I don't think, so I don't have to speak in metric, right? Good, thank God. I do, I've do. i been teaching myself metric, how to speak out fluently the metric equivalents to things since I've been on YouTube. Since I've got quite a bit of an international viewer base that view us all around the world. And of course, the rest of the world, they haven't come around to our way of thinking yet. Which standard is the best? Imperials, I guess they call it. All right, so we already got this block heated up in here, but I'm going to pull it out for just a second. I need to rebuild, rebuild my bed of coke anyhow. So if you see here, we've already got holes. We started with drilling holes. Uh, all the way through the block and I did that just to ease one the drifting thing we don't have to go through the process of punching each hole you could do that if you like to work yourself to death I however do not I like to take the shortest distance between two points if I can so uh, so just drilled these out they need to be slightly they can be the same size or just slightly larger than the finished size of the hole that you're wanting to drift out. Because a square has more volume in it than what a round does, and so therefore it needs to be just slightly bigger for the most part. Now the center one, I didn't do that, and of course I made that flub up while I was getting prepared, so that one's gonna have, you're gonna see why that's important when I drift the big one here, and we're gonna start with that one. What it'll do for you is it's gonna create a lot of suck down. It's going to create a lot of that suck down um, that you see whenever you punch and drift a hole or whenever you just regularly punch. The edges of the hole where you punch just roll into it. Uh, that's kind of bad news if you're trying to create a nice square flush surface for shouldering, right? If you're trying to make a tenon or something, it's got to suck down like that. That's not as nice. Uh, so, so you guys will get to see that one. That'll be the first one we drift because that's going to have the most deformation in the material. It's going to spread the material the most, and it's going to jack around with the rest of our holes and stuff. Most here. Um, yeah, it's just mild steel. So, so we got several different size drifts. While this heats up, I'm going to talk a little bit about drifts and the shapes of drifts and some theories. Everybody likes theories. I like theories anyhow. And you guys are stuck to watching me for half an hour. To drink. That's good. Now if you can see this, since it being really close to that side, that side's bulging out. That's okay, we take care of that with the grinder later. We'll zip that right off. Right, this one we're gonna have to compensate here, dragging back a little bit. So we're gonna, <coughs> we're gonna compensate for that by trying to run the drip in extra. I'm okay. pulling towards me? Yeah. Hold up. Sorry, my fault. Pretty good. What a light, light. These smaller drifts are a little bit more tricky in the respect that. Good. Yeah, go ahead. Lightly. Go lightly with it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And hit it on the corner, like almost on the diagonal. Okay. These smaller drifts, they like to bend around on you if you get them crooked. Go ahead. So it's a real pain. It's a real pain if you have to punch those first. You gotta punch them. You gotta go through, knock out the slug, then go back through, punch them again. You're, you know, you're just asking for about approximately twice the amount of work. Um, although that's not, uh, it's not a huge deal if you enjoy the process of blacksmithing and if you got the time. It's a, it's still a fun thing to do. Wouldn't shy away from hard work. We got two holes there now, basically. I gripped it through. Is that all right? Is that focused in? Good. So we're going to go back through this one more time. We'll take another little heat on it and kind of go back through it on both sides. Just dress that little one out. And then we'll move on to the others. It's about like watching mold grow, ain't it? Always handy to have an extra dripper. So I was also I was asked by the club's president here too also to talk a little bit about hammer control um, and accuracy and things like that during my demonstration here. And so this is a good point for me to stop and do that and talk about that for a second. Um, Blacksmithing is an art. It is not just a bunch of big sweaty men folk wailing away at lumps of material. It's an art. And so with art, it takes a certain amount of finesse. It takes a degree of accuracy and skill. High degree of skill and accuracy. Um, and so if I could if I could entreat anybody to I get asked, you know, well, what's the most important <coughs> thing to learn? Well, what, you know, what should I learn first? Or I, I get all these questions that get asked to me by beginners and things of that nature. And my answer are sides. And uh, we got the larger sides done. So just like before, we're going to go ahead and brush it a little bit. That scale hurts. Oh, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is where we'll have to adjust slightly. Yep. Now, as I've said before, this is kind of the nice part. Right? Don't you all just love power hammers? 
<laughs> yeah, especially the human kind. I know what they're doing. There. We're going to get that all in one. Good. Now let's go. Great hammering. Hit that right dead center. Beautiful. Every time. Well. Good job. Thank you. Do the work. One more. <laughs> Let's do the, well, no, let's do the large one. Let's keep with tradition. You don't mind working hard. You go down to a smaller one, get that depression going. the sweat block. Whoa. Oh, don't give him too much encouragement. I'm not done with him yet. <laughs> The next ones here. We're just marking them, so a couple good hits. Good. And I think we're gonna go. Good. Just keeping that one up. Good. All right, so what we did there is basically we marked out the other ones. We're going to continue to deepen this one here on the end. That'll be our largest depression. It's here. Um, I think that sits over just around two inches, a little over two inches around in diameter. And these were basically made with just a grinder and a flat wheel. 
you grind it off, you keep grinding on it. If you're a fortunate person and have a really nice big south bend lathe or something like that, you can make a perfect thing. Uh, they also, there's, you can find these for sale. You can find stuff. I've used uh, everything from like truck, um, uh, hitches, balls, the ball off the hitch. What do you really call it? Trailer hitch thing. You can use that. Actually, that makes some great tooling if you want to use something like a fly press or make some sort of die to hold those type things. You can shape those all different shapes. Although there's not a whole lot of range, you're not going to get anything really big. And it just, you know, two and five eighths or whatever. There you are. Good. Keep that back up. Yeah, like to come right back up this way. Cool. Yeah, why not, Roy? Now you gotta brush it again. No, that's the cleaning gravel, right? Yeah, yeah right. <clears throat> that's pretty good. Good. Back side. Just give that one. We've lost most of our heat because of my little flub. Well, as he's hitting this, I'm rolling it just ever so slightly. See how you're hooking a little bit, coming off one side. So just try to come straight down. Don't have to hit too hard. You can start relaxing up your hips. So I'm just trying to get a depression. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. You can survive the abuse for just one more. Do that one more time. And we just keep doing that until he tires. <laughs> <laughs> what do you all think? Look good? Yeah, we're good. Get in there. <laughs>